Cinematic Shuffle has shuffled once again. Now, if you were around yesterday on my Twitter handle, I posted three hints for this week's film. It's going to be an author, a fantasy, and a magical romance. I almost didn't get the hints out at all, so it comes to no surprise that nobody was able to guess the right film, which was in fact Ruby Sparks. If I'm not wrong, I think that this is the film that I've reviewed the most times in my life, as I feel like this is my fourth review overall, but first in video format. I actually went back and forth with just the thought of using my last review that I wrote and reading that as this review because that's a good review. I wrote it as a persuasion speech for college. I got an A plus on it, but it wouldn't exactly be a fresh take if I did that. So if you want to read that speech, you can do that. I'll leave a link to it in my uh, description box below. It's good, especially with uh, how I ended it. Anyway, let's chat about Ruby Sparks. Ruby Sparks is ultimately about a fiction writer suffering from a bout of writer's block, and he decides to write about a girl that he's been seeing in his dreams, who, even though she is just in his dreams, he's starting to fall in love with her anyway. And through the magic of his love and through his talent of typing on a typewriter, she literally comes into existence. Things change even further when he discovers he still has that typewriter and he can technically make her do anything that he wants with just a few strokes of the keyboard. That was insane! You manifested a woman with your mind. Before I go on with my review, please head over to my Twitter handle at IAMDWG to be notified when I post my three weekly hints for the next Cinematic Shuffle review. I'll be doing that later on today because I actually have to schedule out that review since I'm going to be going on a family vacation this week, so I won't actually be around normally to do my Cinematic Shuffle review. So be on the lookout for that, but on my review of Ruby Sparks. This is one of the four movies that I recommend on the top of my profile on Letterboxd, along with Dan in Real Life, The Killing of Kenneth Chamberlain, and of course, my movie, Secret Scene. Gotta have a little bit of shameless self-promotion, right? It's there because it's easily one of my favorite films ever made, and that really shouldn't be that hard to believe given that I have reviewed it four times at this point. Why? Because it's not only a really great original film, but it's also something that you can dissect and talk about on a deeper level, as I've proven with the fact that I've literally written college papers on it. Yes, papers, plural. What is it about the film, though, that I find so alluring? First of all, it was the movie that first introduced me to the actress Zoe Kazan, who also wrote the film, by the way, her first screenplay. And even though I've seen Paul Dano before in Little Miss Sunshine, which he did a great job in that, this, in my opinion, was probably his standout for me. Everybody now talks about him being the Riddler in the Batman film and everything, but in my opinion, I'd argue that mostly anybody could probably do that role similarly, but his smaller budgeted films like this, only he could. And only Zoe could as well, who just kills it playing a fictional character that becomes real, that becomes non-fiction. But she's always held back, because technically, she's this guy's slave, forced to do his bidding if he wants. So, the movie plays out in a very light-hearted kind of way, with a couple of darker twists and turns throughout, but at the heart of it all, if you're paying attention, it's ultimately just about one man's insecurity. And what happens with that insecurity? when you give it what it wants, which is, by the way, wholly unrealistic. We all have insecurities, and most of the time we can't do anything about them. But what if we could? That's one thing that I mentioned in my uh, persuasion speech, more than anything. What if? That is the question that this film poses from beginning to end. And it also poses to answer those questions at the same time and prove, hey, you don't know what you really want. Because this whole obsession with the idea that you're a genius, which, by the way, his character does have, and this idea of what perfection is in his head, it's not realistic. And yeah, he tries to force Ruby Sparks to be everything that he wants, but the more that he changes her, the more she pulls away from him. She goes out with some friends, and being lonely, he writes in the fact that she's clingy, and she can't live without him. But then she becomes too clingy, hilariously clingy, clingy to the lengths of severe depression. So he writes in that she's now happy, and then she's too happy, maniacally happy. The list goes on and on and on. It's literally a movie featuring a snowball effect where it just gets worse and worse, not unlike, you know, covering up one lie with another lie. It shows that he already had the perfect girl. 
and his insecurities and his need to be the best at something just started to ruin this miracle that he had right in front of him. There's a very deep rooted story going on in this film masked in a lightly toned film. And like I said, Paul Dano, Zoe Kazan, they killed it in the performances, especially Zoe because she had to pull out all the stops in terms of her emotional roller coaster of a performance. And by the way, they are actually married if you didn't know, and they have been for the last 16 years. So I'm sure you can imagine the chemistry there is pretty strong. A couple of negatives in this film would really just kind of come down to how you watch it and what you take away from it. On the surface, you, you have a man controlling a woman. That can be perceived as sexist and horrible, and it is. But that's the point. In a very big way, Paul Dano's character, even though he is relatable in his insecurities and his writer block problems and even his romanticism, he's severely flawed, particularly because of those insecurities. And he allows those insecurities to control him. He lets curiosity blend with his imagination and he does what he promised himself that he would never do and he starts forcing his girlfriend to do what he wants. And in the process, he learns how absolutely awful of a human being he is. It allows him to retrospectively see how his actions affect others negatively, which in the beginning of the film, he was unable to see, completely blinded by his ego. And the more he goes down that rabbit hole, the more absolutely broken he becomes, the more guilt-ridden he becomes. But he's still stubborn because he thinks he can make things better, which he can't, because some things are out of your control, even if you have a magical typewriter that can seemingly do it all. I'd personally argue that you can use this film as a tool to answer some questions that you might have in your life, particularly those what if questions that we're all guilty of asking ourselves. We can use the film to appreciate what we have rather than allow desperation and our idea of perfection rule our lives. This is a fun, entertaining flick on the surface, but it's definitely something that you can get more out of upon deeper inspection. My rating for this film is an A letter grade. Final overall score, 94%, 94 out of 100 possible stars. The only reason that that's an A, and not an A+, by the way, really comes right down to the side characters and their use in the film. A lot of them aren't really all that super memorable, nor do they add all that much. Ultimately, final grade is an A, but it is important to note that my personal bias score was indeed 100%, but guys, have you seen Ruby Sparks? If so, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on the film. As for YouTube, you guys know what to do. Hit that like, subscribe button, and bell to be notified when I come out with my next installment for the Cinematic Shovel. And until then, peace out.